So hi everyone, my name is Janet Dunn. I'm with Keck Graduate um, Institute. I'm the Outreach and Admissions Coordinator here and here today to speak a little bit more about the role of um, diagnostics in public health emergencies is Dr. Travis Schlappi, the Assistant Professor in Medical Diagnostics. So Dr. Schlappi, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Uh, Janet, welcome to this webinar on uh, the role of rapid point of care diagnostics in public health emergencies. As she said, I'm, I'm Dr. Travis Schleppi and I teach medical diagnostics here at uh, KGI at Kick Graduate Institute. So let's get started. Um, I've enjoyed this game the past couple of years. It's a board game called Pandemic. I don't know if anyone else has played it uh, with family or friends. And basically it's a, you know, it mimics a pandemic spreading throughout the world. This game was actually made before COVID. Um, I didn't find it until, until after COVID, but if you've played it, there's several roles. There's the scientist, the researcher, uh, quarantine specialist, medic. You play these roles to try and uh, defeat the pandemic before it overtakes the world. What I think is missing, and I'm a little biased, I'm a diagnostics person, but where is the diagnostician? Where is the testing person? There should be a specific specialist, you know, that does testing in addition to the scientist, the researcher, and the operations expert, et cetera. Today, I'm going to try and convince you of the importance of diagnostics in public health emergencies, not just pandemics, but other things as well, and the importance of testing quickly and frequently um, people in pandemics. So uh, here's the impact that point of care diagnostics can have uh, in a few examples of infectious diseases. So uh, HIV and AIDS, there could be 2.5 million dailies could be saved if people had access to antiretroviral therapy, which most do, and if there was a diagnostic, a point of care diagnostic that was accurate. Um, DAILY stands for Disability Adjusted Life Year, and it's, it's a better metric for measuring the impact of drugs or treatments or, or diagnostic devices that, that economists and healthcare, public health officials use. Uh, for malaria, I've highlighted it in red here, 2.2 million adjusted lives could be saved, and we could prevent 447 million unnecessary treatments per year. So why, that's half a billion, that's a lot of unnecessary treatments. Why are all these unnecessary treatments happening per year? I mean, if there's 8 billion people on the on Earth, that's that's uh, one out of 16 uh, of us is getting an unnecessary treatment for malaria. Why is this happening? It's happening because malaria has very similar symptoms to the common cold, to the flu, to other types of infections. And so you don't know if it's malaria or if it's something else. And at least where malaria is in an in, in is endemic in those regions, they just automatically assume it's malaria and they treat you for malaria, even though you may not have malaria. These unnecessary treatments not only cost money and time, but they also contribute to the spread of drug resistant malaria infections uh, because people that didn't have malaria got treated with a drug against malaria and now they've, they've developed resistance to it. Um, tuberculosis, it would save 400,000 lives if we had a point of care diagnostic and STI, sexually transmitted infections, 4 million dailies, and avert 16.5 million gonorrhea and chlamydia infections. So it's just a diagnostic test, it's not a cure. How are we you know, averting or preventing 16 million infections? Well, if we have a rapid point of care diagnostic test, we know who, who has chlamydia, gonorrhea, who doesn't, and so we can stop the spread um, by knowing who has it and who doesn't. <clears throat> So what is a point of care diagnostic? Uh, what we're used to, at least in developing countries, is centralized labs. We get our blood drawn by a healthcare professional. They send it to a lab, and this is what the lab looks like. It's these big, fancy instruments. They're hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes a million dollars, and there's lots of them strung up together in a row. They'll run the lab tests, and then you get your lab report back that tells you if your cholesterol is too high or too low, or if you have HIV, or if you have the flu, or coronavirus, you know, in a recent example. What we want to do, or what I think we should do, is move from centralized labs to at-home and point-of-care testing. Uh, the classic example of an at-home test is a pregnancy test. You pee on a stick, and with this lateral flow test, you know if you're positive or negative within a few minutes, you know, if you're pregnant or not pregnant. 
Uh, we need to be able to do this with infectious diseases and know if you have or don't have HIV, know if you do or don't have an STD. And in the most recent example, the past couple of years, COVID. Know if you have COVID or if you don't have COVID with an at-home test. <clears throat> Uh, how can diagnostics help in public health emergencies? Well, you know, whenever you have hurricanes, flooding, natural disasters, you need to test the water to make sure it's safe to drink. If we had rapid point of care tests, that would speed up uh, the water testing and then people could, could safely drink the water in natural disasters. Nuclear disasters, we need not, not, not point of care tests for infectious diseases, but rapid radioactivity assessments to know if it's safe to be in an area or if you're getting uh, radiological poisoning. And then a uh, bioterrorist attack coming back to infectious diseases. Usually these are infectious diseases. We, we need point of care tests to rapidly determine who is infected and who's not infected by the bioterrorist attack. And then also infectious disease outbreaks. So there's viral pandemics, influenza, HIV, yellow fever, SARS, MERS, Zika, COVID-19, malaria, tuberculosis, and typhoid. And then antibiotic resistance is another uh, infectious disease outbreak that we are seeing, you know, some issues with antibiotic resistance. And it's going to become an even larger problem uh, a few decades from now if we don't um, attack it now, kind of like climate change. If we don't do anything now, we're going to have issues in a couple of decades. Well, with antibiotic resistance, the less we do now and the more antibiotics we treat people with when it's when they're not um, the right antibiotic for the right pathogen then the, the patients have antibiotic resistance and it spreads. Also, there's antibiotics all over the place, you know, with, with our livestock and, and poultry. It's in our water, it's in our agriculture. And so antibiotic resistance is spreading um, and it's gonna be in it, uh, a big problem. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, I, they published a paper in 2018, which was pretty prescient uh, a year or two before the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll highlight here SARS, you know, sorry, COVID-19 is, is SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this is SARS, you know, CoV-1. Back in 2003, the fatality rate was about 10%. Fortunately, COVID-19 is much lower than that. But what they learned from this is that from the outbreaks of SARS back in 2003, they, they learned that we need more international focus and funding, and we need additional work to improve current diagnostics, develop point of care tests and ensure reliable availability. Unfortunately, most of the world did not adhere these, these warnings from the WHO. Uh, we wish we had. We wish we had put the work in to have point of care tests ready to go for any kind of pandemic that, that could have happened from SARS. Um, and another interesting note from the study is that six of the 10 pathogens that they, they studied uh, had critical, important, unmet diagnostic needs. A lot of times in life, in the news, in the media, treatments get all the glory and glamour, vaccines and drugs and new pills for this and that, but diagnostic needs are actually very important as well in controlling pandemics and public health emergencies. So uh, where can diagnostics help in disease outbreaks? Well, they, they help prior to the outbreak to surve for surveillance to know if something is coming up and for the initial detection of the outbreak in the acute stage. And so let's call the prior to the outbreak, uh, November, December, January, uh, January of 2020, November, December of 2019, that it would have helped in, in COVID-19. The acute stage from March to I would say we're probably late stage now and hopefully going into resolution. But in the acute stage, it's to verify cases, to know who has the disease and who does not have the disease, which enables isolation and quarantine and, and prevents the spread of the disease. Um, it also helps with treatment selection, knowing what to treat the patient with. If you have COVID, that's different than the flu or, um, or a common cold, and you're gonna have different treatment uh, for those. <clears throat> And throughout all the stages, oh, and then we go to resolution, it's to confirm that the outbreak is over and to allow for continued uh, surveillance for future outbreaks. During all the stages, uh, diagnostics are gonna help with vaccine and therapy development, collect epidemiological information and with ongoing research and clinical trials. How are you gonna know if your new fancy COVID vaccine is gonna work if you don't have a diagnostic to test to see if it's it's reducing the viral load, you know, in a patient. 
So uh, diagnostics are important in all the different uh, stages of these outbreaks. <clears throat> so knowledge is power. Um, I kind of already went over this, so I'll, I'll go over this pretty quickly, but who has it for quarantine and isolation? What is causing your symptoms? If we're able to know what's causing the symptoms, we can give you the right drug or the right treatment. Do you still have it? Can you go back to work? Can you go back you know, into society uh, without infecting people? And then did this treatment or vaccine work? We put a lot of money, uh, billions of dollars towards treatments and vaccines, a lot of resources, time and effort. We need to know if they're actually working so that we can properly allocate our resources of time, effort and money into the right vaccines and treatments that, that are reducing uh, the disease severity. <clears throat> so timing is key in all of these stages. There's a big difference between a, a diagnostic test that takes five or six days, like at the beginning of the pandemic, then if you got a COVID test in March, April, May, June, July of 2020, it took at least three days, sometimes up to a week to get your results back. And we really need shorter turnaround times. Um, for prior to the outbreak, for surveillance, I'm gonna give us some examples of Ebola and yellow fever, where short turnaround times were, were crucial um, for that. And then when you're in the acute and late stage for transmission reduction, allocating resources to the right geography, and treatment selection, you need a short turnaround time for, for all of these. For, for a milder, well, it's, it's mild for younger people. It's, it's, COVID was pretty severe for older, for older people, but for severe diseases, time is, time is life. If, if you have a, the wrong treatment at the beginning, or it takes you two or three days to get the right treatment, you, you could die, you could have disabilities, um, the infection gets worse the longer that it doesn't get treated. And so we need a point of care diagnostic that works within hours and not days to get the right treatment uh, to the person. And not only to save that person's life, to prevent, but also to prevent the spread, um, especially for milder diseases like COVID that are highly transmissible. The earlier you can detect, the earlier you can quarantine and the earlier you can stop people from spreading it. And then also for resolution to, to have an end to the outbreak and reopen the economy, we need a short turnaround time. Imagine, you know, wondering if you have COVID and you go get tested, you feel fine, you know, after a day or two. And so it may have just been the common cold, but if you have to wait five or six days for your test result to come back before you can go to work, well, that's five or six days of lost uh, productivity, you know, you know, for our economy and for your job and, and, and money and all of that. Uh, if you do have COVID now, you definitely should have stayed home. But if you didn't have COVID and you could have gone back to work, well, that's a lot of lost economic output. Okay, so uh, here's a case study in 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. We have the purple line, which is the real cases per week. So up maxed out at 800 cases per week. And then we fell down. This pandemic ran its course over about a year and a half. The, the authors of this study concluded, well, so for one, there was a three-month delay in just identifying that it was Ebola, you know, rather than something else. And then we had a five-day turnaround time for each Ebola test. The authors concluded that if we had diagnosed 60% uh, of the patients within a day instead of five days, then we could have reduced the attack rate from 80% to nearly 0%. And that early diagnosis could have controlled 30 to 70% of cases saving thousands of lives and billions of dollars. Their hypothetical case is if we had a one day turnaround time rather than five day turnaround time is that we would have peaked around 600 and sharply dropped here in October of 2014, the number of cases. Because it was a five day turnaround time and waiting for these results to get back and therefore people spreading Ebola to others, we peaked at 800 and the pandemic did not end until October 2015 and cost a lot more lives. In 2018, things went a little better. There was a, a Cepheid point of care diagnostic test for tuberculosis, and they were able to swap out the tuberculosis cartridge for a Ebola cartridge. And they were able to contain the Ebola outbreak a lot better because they had um, health workers that, that rapidly set up testing labs in transmission zones and delivered faster results. The turnaround time was hours instead of days or weeks. And with the turnaround time of hours, the number of cases peaked at about six, you know, in a week and, and came down in June. This was only a couple months uh, of an outbreak here in, 
in the in the DRC in Congo, Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, rather than the hundreds of cases per week that happened in 2014 when the turnaround time was five days. Here's some epidemiological models to uh, further convince you that um, diagnostics are important in, in controlling pandemics. We have infection on the y-axis and daily testing volume on the x-axis. And here's some, here's, you know, this is just theoretical models right here. S0, S10, S30 stands for how much public health measures they're doing. S30 is the highest level of masking and, and vaccines and hygiene and washing hands. S0 is basically like, we're not doing any masking or washing hands or anything like that. And so we see that with diagnostics, if the more we test people, the faster the infection rate drops, all right? When there, when there aren't public health measures there. If we're doing very good at masking and washing hands, diagnostics have a smaller effect. But we, we lived through this, you know, some countries were good. The US, I don't know, I don't know if we we're good or average, but we weren't perfect at masking and, and, and public health measures and hygiene. And so we're probably in this green or red line here where diagnostics would help us a lot with controlling the infection rate. Here's the positivity uh, rate, the, the real data. So we have the red, which is simulations. And then the real data is these blue squares. It's not a perfect correlation. You know, when you're when you're testing one people per thousand, it all kind of groups here on the positive rate curve. But we do have a, a clear trend that these countries that tested, you know, one and a half, two or more, the countries that tested more had a lower positive rate. They, they were able to control the infections a lot better. So France, for example, testing at about 1.6 people per thousand and their positive rate curve peak was much lower than other countries. You know, these countries up here that were basically not testing at all had a much higher infection rate. Uh, and then most of the countries fell here in the middle. Here's another epidemiological model. If there's no random testing, the prevalence of the disease just monotonically increases like that. All right, and then the cost, which is in billions of, of uh, European denominated currency are, are gonna go up. If we do have testing, okay, so if we test like five or 10 or 20, you know, these are relative metrics. When we do have testing, the more testing we do, you can see our, our prevalence decreases down to 0.5 and our economic cost is about a third as much as if we uh, did not have the testing. Saved lives, similar story on saved lives. We're gonna save a lot more lives the more testing that we do. And this, this is plotting it um, according to our effective or like the, the rate of disease spread. So here's some more real data from early on in the pandemic, uh, March to June of 2020, South Korea was the poster boy of having a lot of testing and we see that their infections stayed pretty low. All right, per capita. So this is an absolute. You can't just say, oh, South Korea had less people. No, this is per 100,000 people. South Korea had a lot fewer cases. You know, here's the EU and then the United States. Uh, we had, you know, a lot compared to the EU and South Korea because we were not testing as much. South Korea had wide access to molecular testing with those that had symptoms of SARS-CoV-2. They did aggressive contact, contact tracing and they isolated those that were infected in quarantine of contacts. So what went wrong in the US? Well, we were late on ramping up the testing, our manufacturing supply chain distribution, we just weren't ready to, to do this much testing. The government didn't act quickly and hesitated to use the Defense Production Act. We had slow turnaround, turnaround time made tests. So even, even though we did finally ramp up manufacturing supply distribution, I believe the government did, did finally use the Defense Production Act, our technology, was had slow turnaround time tests. Most of our technology is what we call PCR tests, which take a couple days to get it to get back from the lab. And so, like I said at the beginning, we were waiting anywhere from three to seven days to get a result back. While we're waiting those days, asymptomatic spread is is happening. Um, and New York Times published on March 16th, coronavirus is hiding in plain sight. For every known case of coronavirus, another five to 10 cases are out there undetected. So either asymptomatic carriers or symptomatic carriers that, that just either didn't get a test or try to get a test, but could not get a test because it took too long or too much backlogs. <clears throat> so here's, let's just do a hypothetical example. Let's make the numbers easy. 
uh, to show how the turnaround time affects uh, controlling disease spread and preventing outbreaks. So if symptoms start on day zero, all right, well, you're infectious anywhere from negative day negative one to six, all right, that's when you're infectious. And your symptoms may start on day one, you know, one or two days after you've been in, infected is when you'll have symptoms. So a responsible citizen, as soon as they feel symptoms, they would test and self-isolate. All right. But they don't feel symptoms till day one. So they've already spread it to two people, assuming an R naught of two, which COVID-19 has an R naught of two or three. R naught is, is uh, the reproductive number, like how, how uh, frequently it spreads, the doubling number. Um, so if it's between two and three, that means every one person that has COVID will spread it to two or three other people. So sorry, not the doubling number, just think of it as, as uh, the reproductive number, how many people one person gives it to. So within a day, they've spread it to two other people, all right? And now they feel symptoms on day one, so they go get tested. Well, those two other people are now spreading it to two other people on day zero. And then day one, it's gone to four, and then eight, and then 16. So by day five, we're at 16 people have, have been infected with COVID from that original person. Even though they went and, and quarantined and isolated during that time, we still had 16 people that, that get the disease. They're waiting five days for their test result. And so we can't even start contact tracing until you know we know we have a positive test. Then we try and find those 16 people um, that, that the disease was potentially spread to via contact tracing. Now, not everybody's a responsible citizen. If you're an irresponsible citizen, you feel symptoms, you get a test, uh, but you don't self-isolate until you're positive. You're like, nope, I'm not gonna quarantine until I know it's positive. Well, that's five more days of spreading the disease. And with an R naught of two or three, we end up at 31 total infected people um, from the person you know, wandering about while, while they were infected, waiting for the test result to come back. Okay. So let's imagine we had a one day turnaround time. So th these kind of numbers, this example, it led Bill Gates to say at the beginning of the pandemic, the majority of all US tests are completely garbage wasted. The reason he's saying that is because you can get tested, but while you're waiting for the results, people are spreading the disease, you know, whether you're responsible or irresponsible, irresponsible, more and more disease gets spread. But even as a responsible citizen, you spread during that first day or two, um, you know, while you, while you're waiting to feel symptoms. Okay, so here's another example with a one hour turnaround time. So if we have a one hour turnaround time, as soon as you feel symptoms, you can get tested and you get your results back, you know you're positive, you can contact trace back to anyone that you saw in the past day or two, and we can stop it at four people, you know, that the disease was spread to, as long as, you know, our contact tracing is good and we all have a one hour turnaround time test. So with sufficient testing capacity and rapid turnaround time, you know, <clears throat> we can test people with exposure and any kind of suspicion of COVID and then catch the virus earlier uh, before they, they transmit. <clears throat> so we need to transition from these large behemoths, these large instruments that take three to five days and transition to point of care rapid tests uh, for COVID-19 and for other pandemics. These, so the roche Cobas systems, they can do 960 samples in eight hours, which is great. They're churning out high throughput. It just takes eight hours. And that's just the assay. By the time it goes to get shipped to the lab, the results go through all the different levels and come back to the patient. It, it's taking a couple of days. Although nowadays, you know, they're down to maybe a day or two of getting your results back. Okay, so some point of care applications for rapid diagnostics is at home, self-assessment and screening. Uh, we're doing this nowadays with COVID tests being mailed. You know, we, you can buy them at Walgreens. We got some free ones from the government mailed and we can do self-assessment and screening at home. In the community can do screening at Walgreens or at drive through facilities. In the clinic for diagnosis and treatment selection, um, choosing the right treatment. And then in the hospital for triage, isolation, diagnosis, treatment, monitoring and selection, knowing, you know, who has the disease and what severity of disease they have will help with triage and putting them in the right spot in the hospital. Here's some examples of, of COVID-19 uh, diagnostic devices that received an EUA in the past year or two. EUA stands for Emergency Use, Use Authorization. Uh, it's from the FDA to allow 
during a public health emergency, diagnostic tests to be used without the full 510, 510K clearance from the FDA. So Cepheid, BioFire, Mesa Biotech, Abbott, Q Health all received EUAs of uh, at one point or another for their COVID-19 tests. And it expires when the public health crisis is over, which is hopefully, you know, getting there, but I believe their EUAs are still uh, valid and in force um, currently. So uh, two that I'll highlight that are at home COVID tests, uh, Lucera Health. And so we've gotten more, uh, you know, recently. Uh, these are nucleic acid at home tests. And I'm gonna differentiate these from the ones that you're receiving at home uh, that are, you know, $10, for example. The $10 ones, they have a high specificity, meaning they'll tell you that you don't have the disease, but their sensitivity is lacking. Meaning if you do have the disease, it's, uh, well, if you're asymptomatic and you have the disease, it's about a 50-50 shot that the positive results, you know, that you're actually gonna get a positive. There's lots of false negatives, meaning asymptomatic carriers will test with the at-home tests and it shows up negative, but it's a false negative because they actually have the disease. They just don't have a high viral load. And so they're not showing symptoms and the test won't pick it up. These two tests are different from those rapid lateral flow tests that you've probably used at home. They're nucleic acid based tests and they do have high sensitivity. So they will pick up asymptomatic infections. However, they're pretty expensive. Lucera comes in at about $50 a test and you need a prescription and then Q Health just the reader is $250 and then a three pack is 195. So about $60 a test and you need to buy the reader. Um, they originally advertised it as hundreds for the device and tens of dollars for the cartridge. And then I just looked it up and they came in at these prices. Here's some emerging technologies we've seen in the literature. There's DNA Nudge, which has a CE mark, which is the European um, version of a FDA uh, clearance or an EUA, and so DNA nudges in Europe, they're, they're a lot faster. They claim they can do it in less than an hour. There's Tiger Tech, uh, basically measuring your blood pressure and then discerning COVID from your blood pressure or breathonics, detecting VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds from your breath. And so they can tell from the VOCs coming out of your breath uh, whether or not you have COVID. Here's some unmet needs for future public health emergencies. Uh, you know, for the next pandemic, affordable, they are getting pretty, so they are getting pretty affordable, you know, they're, they're $10 or less, but they're not sensitive and accurate. The, the rapid lateral flow tests that you have at home, I, I don't have, I don't have, I should, I should have put these on this table, but they're not here. I just have Q and Lucera, the ones that are sensitive. Okay. But they're not as affordable or they're 50 to $60 per cartridge. And then they're not really equipment free, at least for Q Health, you need to buy the reader in order to use the cartridge. Expert and Alir are the larger instruments I, so, I showed you three or four slides back. They're not affordable either. They're thousands of dollars for the instrument. They're not as user friendly. They usually need to be run in the lab. And then uh, they're not equipment free. They're not deliverable. These are the metrics that the WHO uses to determine the, the quality of a diagnostic for uh, limited resource settings and for the point of care. So unmet needs going into the future is multiplexing. All of these devices I showed do not multiplex. When I say multiplex, I mean, can they detect more than one target at a time? So as we're nearing hopefully the end of this pandemic and we go on, coronavirus is gonna be with us forever. Hopefully it just turns into you know a, a common uh, virus that, that causes a, a common cold. Is it COVID or is it influenza? Is it malaria or is it HIV? Is it E. coli or is it Staph aureus? We need to be able to differentiate multiple targets, COVID from influenza A, from influenza B, from um, other coronaviruses or other respiratory infections. Another unmet need is disease surveillance. So low-income countries need affordable, available, and multiplex diagnostics. The earlier we can catch these things, the, the faster we can um, stamp them out. And if it's too expensive, we're not gonna be able to do surveillance. Surveillance is you know random testing everywhere. And we can only do that if it's low cost and point of care. Uh, economics and logistics, we had poor commercial viability of the diagnostics during non-outbreak periods. You know, companies aren't gonna make money making tests if no one's gonna use the tests. And so there's an economic problem there. Uh, we need to incentivize uh, companies to make tests even during a non-outbreak periods. We need to be prepared for mass manufacturing of new tests if there is an outbreak. 
and we need market commitments and pooled procurement mechanisms and stockpiling to be ready for the next pandemic. And here are the, the references, uh, the papers that I referenced throughout this talk, and I will take any questions. <clears throat> I don't think there are any questions, but thank you so much, Dr. Schlappi, for the wonderful presentation and for informing us about everything dealing with COVID, the behind the scenes, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to email admissions at kgi.edu. We truly appreciate you for your time. And again, thank you so much for being here and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.